You had mentioned that in 1977 you started the paddle boats. At the time you were still working for the Baltimore Gas and Electric Company, had not yet been the executive director of the city fair. What got you started on the paddle boats? What well, let's correct your sequence of events. I had the city fair had already existed eight years. It started in 1970. I was executive director in 1972. Ah, right, okay. I started the paddle boats in 1975. Uh, we were two years in. Well, it was a paddle boat and sailboat operation. And the intent was the sailboats at that point. That was my, that was my dream, to have a sailing club. But sailing was infeasible for the... Well, sailing was feasible to the extent that people wanted to sail. But sailing was not feasible to the extent that it made the cash flow. Right. Uh, we were two years into that when William Donald came to us and said, hey, give me a boat that goes from here to there. And there was nothing either here nor there. At the That's right. There, When you went from here to there, you didn't know which you were... You had reached. Which is now Harbor Place to the Harbor Science Place Center. and the Science Center. Okay? What convinced you that there would be a here and a there? William Donald Shaver. He was a man worthy of being followed. And you did feel that his vision of construction <coughs> and development was both feasible and going to be realized? Well, to the extent that, uh, with respect certainly to the water taxi, there was, it was a good deal of money for me at the time, but it wasn't, it wasn't company threatening, the risk involved. That is, if it hadn't worked at all, <coughs> I could have still gotten out of it with very, rather small losses. I mean, that, that's, that's the point. That How many boats did you have running on that? Well, that first, what, water taxis? Yeah. And one. Just a one boat. One 21 passenger electric powered boat that ran sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, we really didn't do much with it from 77 till, till 81, till the aquarium opens up. Uh, there wasn't any place to go. Nothing was there. So it was just for people who wanted to take a little boat ride. Really. We had a point of origin, and we had no destinations. So people took a little boat ride. Uh, and that was fine, but you can't make money doing it. Not, not with what we had. And there wasn't anything to see, because uh, we weren't running that far. We went no further than, uh, than what's now known as Harbor Point, the old Allied property. That's as far as we went, and uh, um, it was a cheap boat ride that some people used, but not many. Were you getting people after the aquarium opened? Were you getting people who had, had been tourists and visitors at the aquarium? Um, no, not really, not not until '83. And part of that had to do with the fact that, uh, quite frankly, we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, in the sense that it's not until 1983 that we began thinking seriously about the water transportation business. And it is at that point that we really start doing research and trying to figure out what do we have here. Now, the crucial thing about that is, where do we go? If you run a transportation, you got to go from here to there. Something, and there's got to be something there. Something has to be there. Well, we had, uh, with our equipment and with our franchise, we had no real destinations. There were places that were spotted as destinations, but nobody wanted to go there because there wasn't much there. Landings that Land, were in Landings there. and attractions at the other end. And this, of course, uh, by 1986, 
when we lay down the planets presently in, in uh, force as what our service would be, how we saw it. Uh, we did develop a vision of what we had to do to make this thing work. And of course we needed a, I'll call it a primary destination. And the primary destination by 1986 was just around the corner. And that was Fells Point. Uh, because while Fells Point was always there, uh, there wasn't a focal point in Fells Point. There wasn't a place for us to land that could serve as a focal point. And that was produced uh, by 1989 in Brown's Wharf. Gave so it was the development point. of Brown's Wharf that really spurred the idea of uh, having a specific landing in Fells Point well, to, to push. No, well, it spurred it. it uh, yeah, okay, we, 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 you can say it that way. I, I tend to think of uh, uh, we needed a credible landing at a place that was credible to the public where you from Missoula, Montana would get off. Because up to this point, you would be getting off at what looked like an abandoned warehouse, which is not particularly enticing. And Brown's Wharf was a rehab building uh, with proper promenade and a proper landing, and that made it possible to focus on that point and to entice you to get off boats. So you would be essentially attracting potential passengers at Harbor Place with the idea of Fells Point as being the primary destination That's exactly because of Brown's right, right on the button. That is exactly what we've done. And it remains our, our, our primary destination for, uh, for the service. And <coughs> what got it expanded <coughs> to other areas on the eastern end of the harbor? Well, Fort McHenry, I assume, must have been of some importance to that. Well, Fort McHenry is a whole different uh, can of beans. And uh, uh, let me talk about the other areas first. Uh, a system. And we think of what we do as a system. It is not a boat ride. Uh, it has to be coherent. And one of our missions that we laid down, when we, when I say laid down, it was quite late, 1985, 1986, was the object of the water taxi is to transport people on interior lines of communication around the harbor. Meaning you don't have to go around the harbor, you go through the harbor to get from A to B or A to Z or whichever it happens to be. That remains part of our plan. We are the most efficient, uh, delightful way of moving around the harbor. Now the intent of that, Richard, had to do with uh, who uses us. Well, we pretty much know who uses us. About 85% are people from out of town. And our objective here was to get cars parked someplace and left. We will do the transferring. Uh, that has been successful. Uh, now, on the harbor itself, sitting on its shores, are two world-class uh, 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 attractions. I say world-class attractions where people will come from, from, uh, 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 Backwater, Montana, to visit Baltimore. <coughs> to there visit. were two world-class attractions on the harbor serving as destinations for tourists from the hinterlands. Well, yeah, the aquarium in Fort McHenry. <coughs> now, uh, unfortunately, getting to the fort has not been easy for us. Uh, we're a bit like the old problem the B&O Railroad and the Pennsylvania Railroad had uh, with the Pennsylvania Railroad. It was trying to get into New York and it never did get to New York except by contrived method. And uh, we are not permitted to go directly to the fort. However, the fort is a very, very important attraction for Baltimore 
because it completes the set. You ought to be able to go into our harbor and reach everything on the harbor with the greatest of ease. Uh, we do that pretty well. But uh, uh, we've not come anywhere close to the potential of Fort McHenry as an attraction. And given a little bit of luck and a little bit of time, we'll, do, we'll, we'll remedy that. Uh, because it is a national shrine. And it is a beautiful sight. And it is a place that can uh, inspire and uh, uh, spur people on to see more of Baltimore. And that's why it ought to be there, not so you ride in King's Water Taxi, but so you can taste Baltimore full, mm -hmm. to the fullest. But the third point on this triangle, being Phil's point. Mm -hmm. Ah, well. Fell's Point, on the other hand, represented an interesting problem in the early days. Uh, until 1990 or 91, if you walked up to a concierge in the harbor and asked, what's at Fell's Point? There's a very good chance you would have been told you don't want to go there. Even that recently. Even that late. Uh, we went into... Uh, that almost reminds me of what you had said about as a... Uh, as a boy being warned away <laughs> from the uh, water. And I heard Gilbert Sandler, who tells Baltimore stories on the radio the other day, and he's also within our age range, right. and he said when he was a boy, he was warned away from the waterfront and warned away from Fells Point. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure, it was no place for kids to play. It was a dangerous place, physically dangerous, in terms of even whether... Individuals had, were out there with malice aforethought, but it was physically dangerous, I mean, with uh, trucks and loading and unloading and all sorts of things, uh, which was a good reason, you know, mother, don't play with that, it'll put your eye out. Mm -hmm. But, uh, uh, yes, we had to, uh, we set up a program, Cammy and I, where in, uh, in the course of a season, we would haul two or three groups of concierges out to Fells Point and uh, just sampler trips so they could see what was here because the concierges were keeping people away from Fells Point. And that was as late as the That was as late as 1990-91. And uh, to a certain extent we have made a contribution toward the popularization of Fells Point as a destination for visitors. Uh, which is rather important. At that point, did Fells Point have still the uh, all the antique shops and old bookshops? Oh, and okay, and yeah, good question. good question. Well, what in taking uh, in putting Fells Point in perspective, one must uh, uh, think a little broader. The Fells Point is an area. Some call it a neighborhood. I call it a state of mind. Uh, but it is an area that for more than 200 years has been in a state of transition. It still doesn't know what it wants to be when it grows up. <laughs> now, what we had in the time frame I'm talking about, is we had a community that was just recovering from having been condemned. Because at one point, uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, what we think of as the beautiful Fells Point Canton waterfront was destined by sort of government fiat to become an expressway. Uh, that was successfully forestalled by Thousands of people fought that idea. Uh, but it still left Fells Point a bit of an empty place. Uh, lots of people wouldn't invest. People wouldn't invest in it. And uh, now simultaneous with that, or almost simultaneous with that, there was another great change that has been... <laughs> <coughs> excuse me. 
has been overlooked. And that was the transference of virtually all seagoing shipping from Fells Point to the Dundalk Marine Terminals and to the Maryland Port Authority, which was created in uh, 1964. So that we had, um, well, the effect of one of the old western boom towns. The gold rush was over. The seamen no longer came. So Fells Point was sort of a waterfront ghost town in a way? To a degree, yes. Uh, you didn't have the seamen. They were out of Dundalk or someplace else. Uh, and uh, lots of residents had been forced out by the condemnation process. With the result that from a period, let's say... 1965 to maybe 1975, Fells Point was a community in uh, very dangerous flux, is a good way of putting it, because uh, you could get places down here very cheaply. You could rent a place. The guy who rented it to you might not even own it. He'd collect the rent, but he might not own it. But at any rate, uh, with the result that we wound up with a community, shall we say, seeking alternative lifestyle. Or as we, when we were much younger, used to call them hippies and that sort of thing. And it became a laid back community. Uh, and in certain circles, very, very popular. Certainly was popular on Friday night. Certainly was popular on Saturday, Saturday afternoon, Saturday night. But, uh, it was an alternative lifestyle. Our shops were funky. Our shops opened more or less irregularly and infrequently. Uh, the merchandise they offered was certainly different, uh, with the result that you get a period, a fairly long period in there, where uh, lots of people walked around wringing their hands, what is going to happen? That seems to be uh, um, straightening itself out. There seems to be a destiny being sought now. Uh, uh, and this is all in the aftermath of defeating the plans for the East-West Express. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, what you have is you have extensive and expensive rehabilitation going on in many, many of the properties. You have your retail space, which commands premium prices. Uh, many, many of what were Saturday, Friday and Saturday night beer bars find themselves changing into trendy restaurants, uh, trying to upgrade, upscale their whole operations uh, to coincide with a lot of development that's taking place. There are office buildings going up all around us. Uh, those people must be served. Uh, or demand services, uh, with the result that we're in a, a latter-day state of rapid and radical change to something I know not of what nature, uh, except it will be different. But you don't doubt that that kind of development is going to continue? Oh, there's no doubt in my mind at all. It must happen. Uh, because you're getting you're getting a, a you're getting a a, a whole uh, uh, whole community of offices and, and upscale services down here. They, people are going to work there. Those people are going to want other services that are something more than uh, uh, a hot dog with some onions spread on. You think many of those people will intend to live in the Fells Point area as well as? work here? Seems to be some indication of that. A lot of indication of that. I mean, you have um, properties that are being built and sold at uh, very, very substantial prices. Um, and I would say it another way, Tom. I believe the aggravation of driving to and from work is pushing a lot of people into Fells Point so that they might walk or perhaps go by water taxi, or ride a bike, or roller skate to work, uh, rather than 
fighting 83 twice a day or any of the other traffic. Yeah. There seems to be a lot of evidence that that is happening uh, ooh, with a, almost a precipitous manner. But the market and the area around the market and the square really hasn't changed very much. Well, yeah. What's going to happen? It will happen. You think, you think the market is going to go? Or? No, no, no. The market won't go. The market will change. Uh, these things change the meat. These change... Okay. We have the market, the Broadway market, capital M-A-R-K-E-T. And then we have the Fells Point market, small, lowercase market. Uh, the market will change to meet the market. Uh-huh. Right. right. To provide the services that are needed. All of the, uh, the various antique shops and funky shops along Alizana Street or Fleet Street, are they relatively actually new to Fells Point development or were, have they been there such a long time and slowly grew? Well, the antique shops are a funny, funny uh, 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 animal. Uh, there's been quite a few antique dealers down here for 20, 25 years. Now, there's another class of antiquer who I like to call it cherry pickers. They say, oh, this will work. Let's rent this place for three months. Mm -hmm. And they come in, and then they too, antiquers are notorious for their hours. Many of them don't keep hours. Or he's understaffed. There's one man. He can't be out buying merchandise and serving as his own retail clerk, right. with the result he isn't open enough. Uh, so there's a constant turnover. But I will tell you, since, 19, since 1991, we've had a fairly constant count of about 37 or 38 antique dealers down here. And it may not be the same at dealers, but the count remains about the same. When did you move to Fellsport? We started service in here on, started water taxi service in the Fells Point on July 2nd, 1989. That was the opening date of uh, Brown's Wharf project. Oh, so you deliberately coincided that with Yes, Brown. well, I had no place to land. Now, uh... Had you been living here personally? Uh, no, 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 no. At that point, uh, we were living in Federal Hill. Uh, down on the South Charles Street. But uh, then in 1990, we moved into Fells Point. And oddly enough, now Federal Hill to Fells Point, that's not very far, right? I objected to the drive. <laughs> <coughs> Why didn't you take the water down? <laughs> well, somebody had to get to work the first time. That's the problem. I objected to the drive. And... Uh, uh, so we, we moved down on Shakespeare Street at that point, uh, almost where we live today, but, but uh, across the street. And we, uh, it was very, very convenient. It was in a block and a half of the office. Uh, all the services that Fells Point offered were what I wanted, and i I become very comfortable. And your office at that time was a trailer. Right, right, right on the water, right at Brown's Wharf, yes. Uh, and we've had a good time. It's been a good place to work and live and play and fight and do everything else. When, uh, when did you move over to uh, 1732 Fame? Uh, 93, Merchant. 92, 93. Something like that. 1992, 93. Has it been? Wow. Time flies when you're having so much fun. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was sort of expecting you to say four or five years ago. It's been that no, long. No, no. It's been, been over ten years. But that's going to have to be moved shortly soon. Also. Oh, wait a minute. Excuse me. You, I answered I answered the question I heard. I didn't answer your question. Oh. Uh, we moved uh, on the Thames Street in uh, 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 February 1, 1999. Oh, so I yeah. was. Yeah. So, okay. So I was. Sorry about that. Your my, my apologies. <laughs> my apologies. I answered the question you didn't ask. But that's going to have to move too soon. Right? Yeah, we're going to move some, uh, but 
Not, because of the maritime. Yeah, not substantively. I mean, we'll be the same place, but a few yards one way or the other. The dock area on uh, Thames Street, that was the original docking area that you established. You know, where, where are water taxi lanes Where you are now. The, well, the, no, we landed at Brown's Wharf. That, right on Brown's Wharf. Right on Brown's right. Wharf property. Uh, that, that space was committed at the time we started service down here. It was committed to the old uh, Maryland Tours company. Had that space tied up. We weren't able to get in there until 99. Uh, and uh, uh, so that's that's a fairly recent, which works instantly. The fight that went on over the East West Expressway, which took so many years, did that, you think, function as a unifying element to the community? Did it make people more community conscious or build more of a family kind of atmosphere into Fells Point as a result of that a kind of cohesion that came from so many people being kind of mobilized by this concern? Well, certainly it was a, it created a common cause. There's no question about it. Uh, it created a sense of, sense of community. There's no question about that. Um, It worked. It did indeed save the community. I mean, we could be presently blocked out by six lanes of highway from the harbor. Which would have destroyed the whole area. Which would have destroyed. I mean, uh, one need only look at parts of New York and any other big city where they built expressways along their water's edge. And you separate the water from the people. So. Uh, but it also created a lot of turmoil because when you create, by particularly government fiat, when you create a vacuum, something has to fill that vacuum. And that's what they did with the condemnation. I mean, all these properties were condemned. And with that condemnation, you created a vacuum. Something will fill that vacuum so that we've had a lot of feuding, fussing, and fighting over what kind of occupancy is going to take place in this broadband. <coughs> uh, the, um, the conservationists versus the preservationists versus the recreationists. Uh, uh, that argument still goes on. And one has fun with that because uh, you have the well, my neighbor, God love him, wonderful guy. He, he is a, a recreationist. He says, I want Fells Point to be like it was. Well, the next question is, like when was? Uh -huh. um, then you, one points out that, gee, are you sure you want that? <laughs> because, <laughs> by and large, over most of its history. Fells Point wasn't a very nice place. I'm not sure it was ever nice until recently. Simply because it was dangerous, it was lawless, uh, uh, it was subject to a lot of transient traffic in terms of, of uh, residents coming and going, not for very long in either way, uh, with the result that to what period are you going to recreate it? And when you get there, you're not going to like it. That's the question. Uh, with the result that it seems to be shaking out now. It seems to be shaking out. There seems to be not a great public agreed on uh, 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 destiny, but rather a, it's kind of a quiet, this is happening. It will, we'll, we'll get someplace. But whether that's good or bad, I don't know. That remains to be seen. You think that uh, gentrification, so-called, in Fells Point is irresistible? <coughs> well, I have problems with that word gentrification. Go on. I have problems with gentrification because it implies if you can read and use a three-letter word or a three-syllable word 
that somehow this is bad and that's absurd. Um, something, there's a population that's going to move into Fells Point that has the wherewithal to move into Fells Point. Now, if that's gentrification, fine, but that applies every place else. And I resent, uh, to a degree, those journalists who try to put a tag on people because they are willing to put a half a million dollars in the rehabilitation of a 200-year-old house and live there. So excuse me while I express my rancor. Good. That was good feeling. <laughs> <laughs> what about the, uh, the impact you think of uh, uh, the plans for such, you know, perhaps big condos, the uh, Broadway Pier kind of thing, or the possibility of killing the open space or access to the harbor? Well, I, that's always a, that's always a battle. Okay, the big condos. Uh, I'm not much on that idea. I'm not much on it because um, condos always bother me. It seems like the people who live in condos aren't part of the community. Now that's my personal impression. I know it's not true, but that's my feeling. Um, and uh, the other thing is we have a community that is to scale. Right now we got a community of buildings that oh, date from as early as uh, 1765 to 1810, 1820 and later. <coughs> and <coughs> they fit. And we can bring visiting vessels in here. And the vessels are in scale with our buildings. And I think it's nice. It's nice to look at. And you can get a feel. At any rate, our buildings right now are in scale with our waterfront and the way we're using the waterfront down here. Uh, yes, indeed, we do have the uh, uh, Broadway, uh, rather, Rec Pier. Uh, Rec Pier, which is a, uh, certainly it's an interesting building. It's one of the more attractive buildings on the harbor at this point. We certainly will not have that recipe again to do such a thing. Uh, is deserving of every attention and meticulous care in how it's to be used. With respect to the use of the harbor and access to people, it's something that, this is one thing the community is very sensitive to, that the harbor, that the water's edge be accessible and that it is willing to fight for it. I'm very conscious of that. Uh, uh, sight lines. After all, the harbor is popular because of the harbor. If we block you off from it, then what's to be popular? Uh, it's one of the problems city planning has in terms of if we let every Tom, Dick, and Harry put a barge wherever he damn well pleases, well, then we use up the water. And a number that's worth thinking about. It's two and a half miles from Harbor Place by water to Fort McHenry. The average width of that body of water might be, average width might be about the 350 to 400 yards. That isn't very much water. It doesn't take long to fill it up. And we have idiot developers who are at one and the same time eating their seed corn because they want to put barges on the harbor to do this and to do that. And that's what it amounts to. They're eating their seed corn. And they're idiots. No matter how much money they make, they're still idiots. And short sighted. Yes. Well, they're eating their seed corn, right? The uh, tourism you think is is really the long range you had mentioned uh, before that tourism is the only really viable industry that Baltimore has invented in the past half century do you think that kind of tourism is the viable future of Fells Point? 
Well, I mean, I think it's part of it, Richard. Uh, uh, the community is made up of many interests. Uh, we have, uh, I'll call it a latent ambiance here in Fells Point. We certainly have a history that is worthy of uh, being uh, trumpeted all over the place. Uh, we have the buildings. Uh, tourism is part of Fells Point. It's, it is a major part of it, at least for the present. Now, as our retailers and our restaurant tours find new new markets, uh, will that remain the same? I don't know. But everything's subject to change. Mm. But on the other hand, <coughs> if we uh, pursue tourism with a vigor. We have a lot of fun. It's certainly going to fill up what I'll call a long transitional period, uh, to the extent that one need not really worry about it um, too much. I think tourism will grow. Tourism will grow um, to two or three times what it is today. Then what happens? I don't know. Would you want to see tourism as the as the primary economic motor here? Not really. It's uh, uh, as one of the uh, motors, yes. As the motor, no. Tourism's too volatile. Uh, you get a fire in Bangkok. Uh, somebody develops a cough in Hong Kong. Um, uh, you have an oil spill in a railroad tunnel. All of this hits this this kind of business. Uh, ter Astonishing, with astonishing rapidity. Um, however, as a transitional industry, and as a as an important element, yes. But as the element, no, I don't think it makes good economic sense. Uh, we aren't uh, we aren't the city of London. We aren't mm -hmm. the city of Paris. We're Fells Point, and we ought to remember that. But Fells Point does have the uh, historical, you know, background of being this oldest or arguably one of the oldest living, working waterfront communities in the country. Isn't this something you'd like to see? Oh, absolutely. Maintain? But um, but we still have, we still have, a, we've got a number of obstacles there. Yes, I, I, I should like to see that played. Uh, and the first obstacle we have is we haven't learned how to convince the world that this is an important place. Uh, the world uh, is not convinced, and we're not convinced yet. Uh, we've got a mile of, of waterfront out here, actually about a mile and a half, that is perhaps historically some of the most significant waterfront in North America in terms of the things that have been done here the things that have been caused by the things that have been done here. Uh, and uh, we haven't learned how to sell it yet. We're just now learning. We've been in the tourist business low these 20, 22, 23 years, and we're just now learning the things to do. Uh, but Thames Street, curiosities that take place along Thames Street, well, the history of Thames Street, just in its names, is important. Uh, we have the job of how do we... How do I get you from the Bronx excited over Thames Street? Uh, how do I get you excited over the fact that just down a couple hundred yards from where we sit, almost directly behind this house, the first USS Enterprise was built? Uh, how do I get you excited over the fact that just a few yards from that was the first riot of Baltimore uh, during the Civil War that nobody knows about? Uh, we have to learn how to, how to uh, get people excited over that. 
Would you like to see some of these things uh, recreated? I don't mean like a Disney theme park, but along the lines of a Williamsburg or a South, uh, South Street Seaport, as in New York, uh, that is like Kemp Shipyard, or you did have an idea a couple of years ago of wanting to recreate the immigration experience mm -hmm. between Locust and Fells Points? Well, I, I'm a believer in interpretive history. Uh, and uh, being, uh, being a historian, I, of course, will spend many hours digging. But you can't expect the world in search of recreation to be uh, that enraptured. We go on vacations to vacate. Uh, and what we're doing is we're relaxing. Now, if we happen to learn something as we are relaxing, that's wonderful. But if I tell you you're going to learn this, you immediately get on a bus and go the other way. Because uh, we spend a lot of our lifetime doing that. Now, interpretive history gives us the possibility of triggering your interest, triggering the public's interest in a, in a subject that uh, upon which they may want to expand their knowledge. Interpretive history also raises people's expectations. And that's the arena in which we should exert a great deal of effort, which is to elevate our mythical person from Missoula, Montana's expectations on what are they going to find when they get to Fells Point or Fort McHenry or Locust Point or any place else. So, we're going back to uh, then asking you, about that, uh, Fells Point, not a fly in amber, but how do you offer a kind of interpretive history? Would you want to see recreations of, say, Kemp's shipyard? Uh, I think of that just as an example. I didn't mean that necessarily specifically. Uh, something like the Chausseur, uh docked at the waterfront. Well, I think certainly you strive to get there, but uh, I uh, think one has to crawl before one leaps, bounds over the moon. Now you do give a Thomas Boyle Award for outstanding contributions to tourism, tourism. so you are promoting the tourism and certainly uh maintaining the uh the name of and history of Captain Boyle. Well now you ask me how we're gonna get someplace. I'm gonna answer that question. Uh <coughs> with the possible exception of uh, Constellation Energy or who have been around town, I see no means of building Kemp Shipyard, recreating Kemp Shipyard and building uh, 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 old Baltimore Clippers as a tourist attraction. But what I do see is the possibility of having some of our neighbors participate in a fun thing that at one and the same time elevates the visitor's expectations. For example, there, were a, there was a group uh, here in Fells Point known as the uh, Baltimore Fencibles, a quasi-military group who participated in, in uh, 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 Old North Point. Now, if I had the money and if I had the means and if I had the time, I would create what amounts to a volunteer group and I would get myself one big damn cannon. And we would have, at least for the season, on Saturdays and Sundays, we would have 
a regular color ceremony at the end of Broadway Pier. There would be a big flagpole down there. And we would do a, using military drill, a kind of tattoo. Uh, given a season, it can make that the most well-attended thing uh, you ever find. Out of that grows some other things. What? I don't know. However, assuming I still have all this money, uh, I would also have myself a ceremonial uh, welcoming crew. Because in the period of which Fells Point had its heyday, so to speak, uh, it was customary when a distinguished visitor come to town, came to town that he was greeted and he was put in a barge that was rowed by the leading citizens of the town. And it was regarded as an honor to be a member of that crew. Now, uh, given my druthers, we could have a lot of fun with that. We could build a very, very active body of people. And then other things would happen. What other things? Fill in the blank. It doesn't matter. Other things would happen. Because not only are we giving you from Missoula, Montana some fun, but we're having a ball ourselves. And that's the contract. You had uh, wanted, it, it uh, wasn't, it turned out it wasn't feasible, <coughs> money, uh, this, that, to recreate the immigrant experience. Uh, the ferry boats Absolutely. Absolutely. coming into the Broadway Pier. Well, we yeah, well, it's still a valid idea, just I'm running out of time. Uh, it has to do with uh, the average American has an image of immigration as the immigration experience, uh, which comes from two places. One, Hollywood, and two, uh, what he sees when he visits uh, uh, Ellis Island. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it was my desire to take that image and make it an experience, which is these people who came from wherever they came from uh, had a moment of truth. There had to be this moment of truth as you got off the boat. My God, I've landed in a new world. I've landed in the land of milk and honey. Uh, I've landed where the streets are paved with gold. You know, all of that nonsense. Not nonsense, reality. Well, they were told the streets were paved with gold. Mm -hmm. They were told they'd have to do the paving. That's correct. Uh, but under any circumstances, the, where I'm going is... But few of us can even conceive what that moment, that instant, as you were getting off the boat, in the case of Baltimore, as you were coming across the harbor, what that instant was. What was the experience of my grandfather, great-grandfather, with his family in this strange land? What did he feel? I believe that that little instant is important to create for our third generation citizen. Uh, I think that that the instant of uncertainty, that instant of doubt, that instant of fear is important to recreate. That it all wasn't just here. That you had to grasp it. And in that sense, I believe there is room for a project back and forth across the harbor. Uh, recreating that moment, that those, well, those four minutes. As one got on the boat over at Hall Street and thereabouts and came over here to Broadway Pier, this four minutes, which served as a break between the old life, between the ties to the, to the Habsburg Empire and this new land that was going to be my own, I believe there is room, and it would be a popular thing, it could be made extraordinarily popular, it could be made 
an attraction of great value both to those who played with it uh, or who used it and to those who were presenting it in terms of Baltimore, Fells Point, tourism, general prosperity, general citizenship, and thank God I'm an American. Wouldn't, uh, and, and that kind of tourism in, uh, of which Fells Point would be a center, a kind of recreation or reliving, re-examining, re-experiencing the past would be, you think, critical to the financial health of the whole city, not just Absolutely. Fells Point. Absolutely. Well, right now, you take the whole city. We probably have something between 30 and 35, 38,000 people working in tourism in one way or another. The number ought to be up somewhat higher than that. Uh, we could probably support as many as 70,000 people. Uh, that's a lot of jobs. And the intriguing thing about it is it, with the proper mindset, those jobs can be created relatively cheaply. Far less cheaply than creating a manufacturing job. A manufacturing job may take $200,000 to create. You can create one of these jobs for a lot less. Uh, which is interesting. William Faulkner, one of my favorite quotes that I like to remember and talk about when I do living history characters, William Faulkner remarked when he got the Nobel Prize, the past is not dead. It's not even past. Would you like to see Fells Point as a repository of that idea? Well, Uh, I have to think about that statement a little bit, Richard, but uh, let's, let's put it in the context of the way I think about history. Um, I have long ago reached the conclusion that history is a force uh, on which, at any given instant, we are all on its leading edge. It is pushing us. It has, by whatever internal forces, there is a direction, there is a, 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 a weight, there is a momentum to it. Um, in this sense, uh, I agree, yes, there is a place. Fells Point is worthy of being remembered, it's worthy of being put into a context. Uh, and it's worthy of pointing out the idea that uh, we can learn from the uh, uh, things of our parents, and it is important to us. You wouldn't want to see uh, Fells Point preserved like a fly in Amherst. Oh, God forbid. So, uh, well, God Williamsburg. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, I, li I like Williamsburg, incidentally. Uh, I enjoy it. It's wonderful to be surrounded by these wonderful, wonderful artifacts. And the meticulousness with which they attempt to pursue authenticity. I think that's great. Do I learn from it? I'm not sure I do. Uh, Because in spite of their uh, search and quest for authenticity, it is inauthentic. Williamsburg was never that clean. Mm. Williamsburg was never that healthy. Uh, the people who make Williamsburg work never looked that good. They were always sweaty. Uh, it's a... And in saying that, I don't mean to be critical of it. I just mean to say that it's uh, too uh, uh, too much pro too much prophylaxis mm -hmm. has been provided. It's too Think it as a kind of a theme park. Uh, it is a notch above a, th a notch above a theme park, but that's what it is. And that's my my problem with it. That, uh, it scrubs out all the little all the smudges 
And the smudges had to be there. That's what made the place work. Are we getting cleaner here in Fells Point? I mean, obviously, all those properties are not condemned. We got a lot of smudges. <coughs> but, uh, <coughs> but, but it's not, it's not, uh, what's the German word? It's not ersatz. I mean, you, you know, you, it, it, it's, it's not phony. Williamsburg is the way it is because that's the way it wants to be, and that's fine. It becomes a corporate objective. Um, uh, is Fells Point cleaning itself up? It is slowly. We got a long way to go. There's sort of a uh, an odd uh, contradiction here. A lot of Americans tend to think that learning something while they're on vacation is going to be somehow morally uplifting, which of course accounts for the popularity of a place like Williamsburg. But Fell's Point, not exactly morally uplifting, but people do seem to get excited about the historical understandings that they uh, glean from just walking these old streets and learning about the old buildings. Uh, is this something that, that Fell's Point is going to serve a need for to, well, to fill with people? I certainly think it's one of the uh, one of the stepping stones that we have to build on. Um, but the lawyers have a term called discovery, um, and uh, uh, artists frequently use the word serendipity. Uh, I believe Fells Point is one of those communities wherein the visitor can engage in a lot of discovery. Oh my God, I never knew that. And achieve, uh, what's the, what's the, uh, the, the meaning of serendipity? Pleasant surprise. Achieve the pleasant surprise in this unlikely spot. And uh, uh, so discovery and pleasant surprises in a place serves to drive home a memory um, uh, that uh, sticks with them. And in my tours over the years uh, that we've had is the object is, if it's an hour tour, give them something they can tell, not point out seven million bricks. Give them a story they can take home. What was the old song, oh, give me the, to build a dream on? Well, that there's there are things that you can carry home and tell over and over again if you make the if you put it together. And that's how that's part of how we get to wherever it is we want to go. I think. We live our lives by narrative, by the stories we tell each other, by the stories we tell ourselves. And this whole area, the harbor in general, Fells Point in particular, seems to be a marvelous sort of quarry from which to dig out wonderful stories of American history to expand on. Is this what you think we're doing with the Dawn I think, I think, Light I think Tours? And we're getting there. And of course we've got uh, here this sometime in the next two months the new museum will open. And I think it's absolutely important. The Maritime. The Maritime, 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 Maritime Museum there on Thames Street. And I believe it is an absolute major step in that direction. And that out of it, a number of things will emerge, uh, particularly in the realm of interpretive history. I, uh, and I think we have to make the effort uh, to uh, provide a little taste of interpretive history uh, around the town. And of course, there are a whole bunch of things. There ought to be markings up, more markings on our streets, uh, explanatory plaques in greater profusion. But um, uh, but I think the major step will be the opening of uh, of the Fells Point Maritime Museum. One of our problems in stimulating.
tourism has been the lack of an authentic maritime museum. Now, we have a maritime museum, but it doesn't, it doesn't remember anything in the sense that it's not associated with Baltimore. Actually, it went out of its way to disassociate itself with Baltimore. Uh, but what is about Baltimore? What is relevant? In this case, we are going at the heart of one of the rich uh, maritime pockets of, of, of our national maritime heritage here in Baltimore. That is unremembered, largely. Now, does this become a primary destination? That's a long ways away. This is just a small museum. Uh, primary destination requires some. Either a miracle, <laughs> a saint of some sort doing something. Uh, uh, St. Patrick marched in the parade. There we go, <laughs> yeah. Uh, or a uh, major plant. Well, we're a long way from both of those. But it does give us a very, very strong uh, ability to focus. And I believe out of that focal, uh, out of bringing uh, parts of Fells Point into sharp focus, other things happen. Other things relative to Baltimore, relative to immigration, relative to industry. Uh, something happens. Somebody says, wow, we can do this. Why can't we do that? Uh, with the result that you, you create excitement and uh, 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 generate uh, traffic. Uh, will it be in the near future something that will attract our mythical mama from Missoula? No. That's a long ways away. But you got to start someplace. But might not it attract, if not somebody from that far away, a great many people from New England or Pennsylvania or Virginia or, or Ohio? Mm. Regional, northeast it'll, quadrant. It'll, no, it will, get, it will get good attendance. Uh, how strong a, an outreach it will have, well, that remains to be seen. But it will be well attended. Uh, whether, and if it's well attended, they will seek greater attendance. And whether you can make the next step will be a function of the vigor of both the uh, Fells Point Preservation Society and the Maryland Historical Society and the citizens and the industry and the city who says, wow, we ought to have, we're going to have a first ring. But keep in mind, as you well know, building museums is not easy. Mm -hmm. Just finding the artifacts that make a museum work take many, many years and obviously lots and lots of dollars. Uh, so that this is a contributory force, perhaps a vigorous contributory force, and perhaps it becomes the, um, the husk wherein my mythical honorary crew can find a home right. and the mythical fencibles can find a home. Perhaps it becomes that. But under any circumstance, uh, it's the, uh, uh, becomes a stimulus. And that's part of its purpose, too. Not only to stimulate you coming in from some other place, but to stimulate me as a citizen of Bell's Point. Gosh, this is a pretty good place I live in. Uh -huh. And revealing to me things I don't know, which I discover every day. Cohering and uh, community spirit. Too. Right. So that, uh, it's a, uh, oh, what's that terrible word? It's, I hate to use it. It's a synergistic kind of thing. <laughs> but, uh, well, advertising people use it all the time. I know. But, uh, I know. They kill a lot of good words uh, for us. But under any circumstances, it, uh, that's its importance. To me, as the water taxi, it's important to me in a direct line because it gives me a chance to sell something. About Fell's point that right now, Fell's point doesn't have a focal point. 
the museum becomes the focal point for my people on my boats to say, gee, when you get down there, you want to go down half a block. Before you do anything else, do this. Uh, this is the starting place, the, uh, uh, what's the French expression? Raison d'être. Raison d'être. Oh, I love to see that such things. In the years that you have been living here, I know this is uh, hard to, to pin down, but in terms of flow or the trends over the years of your involvement in the harbor and Fells Point, what are the biggest changes that you've seen, that you've personally undergone in Fells Point? I mean, has it become, obviously it's become less dangerous than it once was. But has the trend been towards more money or less, more business, more density, or has that stayed the same? Uh, the, uh, the nature of market, large M, market small M that you referred to before, how have those changes interacted? You know, are there any reflections or observations on on those kind of community trends and flow that you might have? Can I take a stab at a different question that's light and along that line? Good. Um, I would be interested in, you picked the times, but like a snapshot of Fells Point, what it was like then and maybe, you know, how it compared to the rest of Baltimore or how it fit into the mm -hmm. rest. Good. Um, and then you could... You know, you could kind of talk about some of the big changes from snapshot to snapshot. Right. Maybe. Yeah. A snapshot in time. Uh, excellent. Great. Uh, what would be? Uh, for instance, as Jackie said, a snapshot of 1991 when you moved here. Would that? Yeah, or even, you know, if there's a particular period of history that you know about that you can envision even if you weren't alive. I mean, just pick whatever snapshots of periods. Or what would have been a difference between, as Jackie said, a snapshot of your memory of uh, the Broadway market when you were a kid and ran a couple of errands out of there, the Broadway market when you moved to Fells Point as an adult resident the Broadway market today, you know. Do you have uh, sort of in your head that kind of snapshots of your memory of Fells Point at specific points in time, either when you were a boy or a young man when you were here, when you were at the Naval Academy visiting, or vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Fells Point the way you saw it when you first actually took up domicile here? Sure. Oh well, yeah, I can think of a dandy one. Uh, or, mm, I guess the better part of a hundred years. We had a Siemens mission across the street here on Broadway. In the middle of the block, two doors down from Jimmy's. And it catered to the mm, spiritual and temporal needs of sailors on the beach. Very dedicated body of people. And one can remember Sunday mornings, Sunday afternoons even, people coming and going to religious services at the mission. And it was right on Broadway. It's right on Broadway here in the uh, 900 block, 800 block. Now, Two years ago, I have a very clear memory, the mission had closed, it ceased function. I have a very clear memory of a Sunday morning of a large number of people waiting outside of Cooper's, which is just around the corner, a nice restaurant, for Sunday brunch. That's probably symbolic of mm. the range of change that has taken place in this community in the last, we'll say, 30 years. Uh, 
in the sense that here are people, nice people going to Sunday brunch for their, their uh, um, mimosas or whatever. I think is that the idea you're looking for? I hope. This is the best idea I have, best snapshots I have in my head. The change from but, Siemens uh, Vision to Cooper's Mimosas. Hey, uh, both had to do with survival, but uh, in different ways. Now the mission has become a furniture store. And we can go around, and there, there are other, uh, probably other, many other examples of that. You can capture little vignettes in time. But uh, none come to mind right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you know, these changes and the changes you, you see, they're not positive, they're not negative, they just are. Life changes. I mean, you don't have a uh, they uh, an opinion on on that in terms of they whether it's good or bad. It just is. <coughs> uh, well, the seamen aren't here. The seamen are downstream, three miles. Not only that, the nature of change on uh, uh, maritime uh, transport is such. Uh, seamen have a hard time having enough time to get off the ship. They load them and unload them so fast. With the result that 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 thing that that traffic has disappeared. Um, secondly, you know, because I look for a drink in the morning, doesn't mean I'm evil. Uh, and those are nice people too. They got brunch, mm -hmm. Sunday brunch. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just society has changed, and uh, got a lot of people can afford to go out for breakfast on Sunday. Which is symptomatic of the community. And a lot of people can afford a lot of things that the community couldn't afford before. And then that hold water? I think it does. Or something. Mimosas. If, and this is a great big if, if money were not the direct problem, and if we had our druthers, what would you like to see done with the Broadway Pier. Also, generally Rec called Pier. the City Recreation. You mean Rec Pier? Yeah, okay. the Rec Pier. Okay, well, I would like to see what amounts to a Baltimore Municipal Marine Center, where in that facility uh, becomes a, a vital facility with real uses uh, dedicated to real people and to do that would uh, of course keep it in the public um, keep it in public ownership and would indeed be a statement that there is room on our shores for one one I mark that public building uh, dedicated to serving the public in a myriad of ways that they all need not be put in the hands of developers or real estate people or whoever else. In the case of Broadway Pier, or rather Rec Pier, see you got me doing it. Right. <laughs> uh, we have a number, for example, there are a number of uh, of uh, uh, book clubs around the harbor whose facilities for meetings on don't really exist. There would be room here for that. We have a number of vessels that need a home. The Pride of Baltimore. The Pride of Baltimore belongs in Fells Point. Uh, the original was built here. It is in scale here. Eh, maybe it ought to be a home there. Perhaps this is the place for uh, fireboat headquarters someplace on the, on the uh, pier. Perhaps the Baltimore City Marine Police Detail should be assigned there. Um, 
The community needs a community center in terms of meeting place for we have enough protest meetings so we keep that keep that building pretty good, pretty active if we want to go. Um, the tugs, I have no problem with the tugs staying there. Uh, we learn to live with each other. We live with each other very well. Uh, but I would do two other things. I would have this facility take over jurisdiction of Broadway Pier, which is the Long Pier. And Ann Street, Ann Street Wharf, uh, in order to create a facility that is also inviting and useful to visiting vessels. Uh, I think that's very, very important. By uh, visiting vessels, you mean? Visit, well, we get, I get schooners in here all the time, and I mm -hmm. put them on, on Broadway Pier. Um, I manage that now, but... I don't. I don't have to manage it. It doesn't require that much management. But, uh, but then there are <coughs> cruise ships. We get the visiting men of war from Britain, Holland, Germany, France, all the time. Uh, but that this should be a vital area of activity of maritime activity. Um, capable of being used by the other facility we're just now about to open, the uh, 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 museum, Maritime Museum, for gatherings or brief exhibits on the water. And this would give that, that uh, institution a capability. Uh, and then as I'm very fond of saying, ultimately something else will happen. I don't know what that is. It's not, not my purview. But that's what I would like to see. I would like to see Rec Pier be remain a public facility. Now, how do we do this? I don't know. I have to find a, a means of funding it. But it's, it's doable. There are lots of other things that are funded, so it's doable. But... But it looks like it's going to be going in the hands of developers and uh, something Fels that Point would... hasn't fully spoken yet. Well, they talk about Jane Jacobs' idea of the importance of density and diversity, fine, but they don't mean the kind of density, I think, that Jane Jacobs was referring to. How does this get avoided? And you said, don't count the community out yet. So, well, okay. Uh, one of my fascinating stories about Fells Point is the fact that it's frequently forgotten. And if I'm repeating myself, cut me off. It had to do with back in 1794, yeah, 94. The uh, legislature authorized the incorporation of Baltimore City. And, uh, uh, but it didn't happen until 1797. And why was that? Well, the reason for that is Fells Point didn't want any part of it. And they didn't want any part of it because they were absolutely certain that those people in Baltimore were going to filch away the tax monies and improve the inner basin to the detriment of Fells Point because they thought of themselves as separate entities. Well, that ability to argue and fuss and fight and fume still remains. It rears its head every once in a while. It certainly showed itself in the road battle. And I can pretty much guarantee you it'll show itself in this battle. Uh, we do not need condos on wreck Pier. We do not need townhouses on Rec Poy Pier. Uh, if perhaps the entire world were filled up and that was the last open space, maybe so. But it isn't the last open space. And what could be built there commercially is a mere pittance to the future. What could be achieved there uh, socially and municipally 
is a great contribution to the future in terms of it being a center of activity, a center of activity to which people can walk. They won't need their cars to get there. A center of activity that is the outlet onto the water. We have access to the water by the promenade. We have sight lines to the water. But where do we get the use of the water? That facility should somehow lend itself to, uh, I'll call it a public-private partnership of how do the citizens of Baltimore get to the water and use it. Uh, a place, and the city needs space for fire boats, and they need space for police boats, and they need space. We need a home for the pride of Baltimore that's in context. Uh, we need a place for visiting vessels. All of these things come together and create a Baltimore Marine Activity Center that fills a need that goes far into the future. And that's my personal view on it. And this would be then the ideal usage for the yes. uh, wreck pier. Benefiting not just, obviously, Fells Point, but really for the good of the whole city. Benefiting the whole bay. Benefiting the whole bay. And uh, uh, that's my concept. You think that uh, likely, realistically, that the city is uh, so upset about the immediacy of the tax base and so forth that they're likely to fall into a short-sighted stopgap? Uh, well, one is remember, one is has to recall there was an incident. Uh, I guess I encountered in a biography of uh, Franklin Roosevelt where a group came to him and they made an impassioned plea to do something. And he said, okay, you have convinced me to do this. Now put pressure on me. Uh, that, I believe, is where this thing rests at this point. That we could indeed convince Martin that this is important. But we would have to figure out a way of putting pressure on him to do it because he has other, there are a whole range of other vital priorities he's got to meet, uh, having to do with money, having to do with running the city, so that it might be, uh, but I, I think that, that, that depicts the present situation. Would we put pressure on him to do it? No, I think so. In terms of long-term long values in right, the city. Yes. Although those long-term values are uh, kind, of, kind of hard to get a politician who has to run for re-election to envision. Uh, there's a, uh, a story that when uh, Zhao Enlai was asked what did he see as the long-term effects of the French Revolution, he said, it's too soon to tell. Yes, that's true. Well, that may be. You think we have a political system that will look down the road that far? It has at times. Sometimes it does, sometimes not. This is a function of the um, of uh, the group and what a, what, a, what a body of citizens want. Uh, that's the function of the pressure, is to bring uh, issues of this sort uh, into focus. This isn't a very large issue. It's a relatively small issue. And uh, uh, it's a case of generating the will to do something about it, which is in the hands of the mayor and others. And uh, uh, this isn't, this isn't uh, like uh, trying to decide uh, uh, whether China should be admitted to the UN. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like that old story of the successful marriage. You know, that old story of the successful marriage. And he says, how do you do it? He's been married 40 years. He says, oh, he said, we long ago made a decision. I make the big decisions, and Cam makes the small decisions. I said, well, how does that work? He says, well, and he says, I decide whether, uh, whether we're going to go to war with Iraq, and Cam decides whether we buy a new car. We're in that kind of a state, and I, make, I don't make light of it. Uh, it just has to do with 
uh, in the case of our present mayor, he is confronted with such a shopping list of things left undone for 12 years of by the idiot preceding him that dealing with these what are almost trifles this is almost a trifle dealing with it becomes hard because it's complex but the city isn't going to rise and fall on it it will take off a lot of people but it's not necessarily going to mean a difference between being elected or rejected and how do we elevate its place on his priority list that this should be taken care of and in saying that no I didn't I, I don't mean to impugn anybody it just has to do with well simple almost simple physics there's only room for so much that's that's the way I see it and we have to properly dramatize it well what do you think William Don Schaefer would uh, would be doing and there are people who are talking about wanting to see him run for mayor, become mayor again, uh, in spite of his years, because he doesn't seem to age. And uh, what do you think William Don Schaefer would be doing? Oh, Lord. He asked me a question like that, boy. Uh, well... Too speculative. Uh, yeah, that, that that that's not a fair question. I I I, uh, I I can't I can't speak for William Tom at this point in his life. I can't speak for him. Uh, at any other point, I can't speak for him. I mean, William well, Don, I mean, William Donald in 1968, William Donald in 1975, William Donald in 1985. He would probably do three different things, but, but uh, uh, he would do something. But he had a long-term vision when. Uh, certainly when he was mayor of Baltimore. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yes, he did. I mean, just the idea of him saying, Ed, I want a boat that goes from here to there, and one day there'll be a place to go. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And uh, one of the things that... that, uh, that uh, <coughs> when we start talking about somebody like William Donald, one of the things about William Donald is we have to have to grasp the fact that for whatever reason he had a body of people available to him that are not available today in all seriousness. A body of first-rate executives who made their time available, made their money available, uh, made the talent that they had available to them available to him uh, that he could tap. I was just looking looking today at uh, an early, well, he was in the city council at this point, but at an early report by the uh, Greater Baltimore Committee. And uh, looking at the giants that made their time and talents available. These people are not available today. We don't have them. Many of these companies cease to exist. They moved out of town. This talent has gone elsewhere. One of the problems that we confront in, uh, 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 in our efforts to go ahead is a huge brain drain. We've had a huge brain drain. Our young people aren't sticking around. They aren't here to start with. They're going elsewhere. Uh, with the result that the solution that William Donald could find in another day is not available today. You can't get there from here, to, to, to put it kind of crudely. But uh, at the heart of the thing is the fact that I don't know how he solve it. I don't know how Martin's going to solve it. I don't know how anybody else, known or unknown, is going to solve these things. But we do not have available for the public wheel the kind of talent we had available 30 years ago. 
you think that's been part of the flow of life or just a glitch in the curve, so to speak? Well, I think it's a function of uh, um, economics. Um, I, I can remember uh, uh, William Donald's early staff. These were people who were not well paid. These were very, very talented people, but they were not well paid. Uh, they were, in many cases, uh, hell, they were little more than paid volunteers. Volunteers who were getting what amounted to a kind of an honorarium rather than a, than a, 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 a salary. Who were absolutely dedicated to the task. That fire in society does not seem to be there. I, I believe, and I, I, I might have said this earlier, I believe that William Donald came at a time when we were still being driven by the uh, Kennedy uh, uh, inaug inaugural talk, the Ask Not speech. You think even in a uh, an area uh, which is as defined as Fells Point, you talked about don't count the community out, and I know there are people in, in and around Fells Point dedicated to feeling the preservation of Fells Point as a critical issue. You think even in the immediacy of Fells Point that has dissipated? Yeah, the amount of volunteer. Amount of, uh, I'll use the term volunteer. Uh, work you can get is, is very limited. Now, it's limited for a number of reasons. That's going to change, though. I think. I think there'll be a slight change simply because of the size of some of the organizations that are moving into Fells Point. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, the architects, consulting engineers, law firms, uh, uh, advertising agencies. We haven't had any big companies down here. Now, for me as a business owner to do, uh, take on a volunteer task, which I have on many occasions, means I have to look at my time, I have to look at my budget and say, yes, I can afford to, when we get to this point, I can afford to take a week and give it all. For a major company, or a sizable company, they have the capacity of giving somebody for six months and getting and having him or her give us what they've got. Uh, that capacity is increasing. The capacity for some of these companies to take on a uh, a seminal leadership role, uh, I think, increases. Because even when I was once president of the business association, there were times where we all agreed we should do something. The question was, who will do it? Mm. And the answer was, well, I, I can't do it. Uh, uh, and we had to wave off on the subject. But, uh, to a degree, I think our capacity is increasing as the development comes along. It's one of the things we get, I think. I think, I hope. I'll ask you something really quirky, getting back to what Jackie said about snapshots. If you were seven, eight, ten years old, you think your mother would warn you against Fells Point today? Well, she probably would, but for a different reason. Uh, as mothers would warn anybody seven, eight, ten years old today. I mean, you go on a playground behind your house, you're warned. Well, of course, but I mean... The world has changed. It wouldn't be the kind of dangerous plays or... No, no. Kind uh, of attitude. But the, the reason for warning... The warning would be there, but the reason for would be different. Uh, yes. Uh-huh. Uh... -huh. uh because, uh, well, we're all aware of it. There, there, there are some nasty people out there on the street. Oh, indeed, indeed. But I meant uh, specific to the Fells Point fear. I mean, the only people who killed children in my day were mothers. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> the, uh, I have heard people express the fear lately that if they built a big condo hotel anywhere in or around Thames Street, 
that this would kill the Admiral Felin, and if it, the Admiral Felin hurt, that would then ruin much of the quality of the whole area around the square. Do you think that's valid? No. Nah. Admiral Fell's got the capacity to go on. Admiral Fell can survive. Admiral Fell has, they've created a product, it's a very nice product. They sell it well. Uh, one day they might have a few months of competition, uh, where they felt the competition, but they would fill it up again. No, I, I think that's that's a, uh, 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 smoke more than anything else. Uh. Here's another thing, going back to the uh, concern with the experiencing and the uh, of history, uh, interpretive history, and I was saying this to Jackie about some of the ghost stories we tell. Silas Clinchbone and Micah Adams, Morgan Williams, that are drawn, that we really and you have built on the history of Fells Point. Is this a palpable contribution to the lore of the neighborhood, of the area, of the idea of Fells Point? Oh, certainly. Uh, the uh, uh, Fells Point is an old enough community. We, we've got lots of ghosts around here. Uh, we're blessed because they're fairly quiet ghosts. Uh, to find them, we really have to have to uh, dig them out. But uh, I was recently impressed by a program on on the History Channel having to do with the ghosts of Charleston. And they have a remarkable gathering of ghosts. And, of course, the reason for that is those Charleston families have been there for seven and eight generations, uh, with the result that there's lots of room for the ghosts to find proper subjects to reveal them, to whom they can reveal themselves. And uh, one of our problems in Fells Point is really not enough of us have been here long enough to uh, recognize that sometimes strange phenomena that takes place is really a ghostly event, not an accident. Uh, that takes two or three generations to recognize that Jesus happens with some regularity. Uh, and certainly with a, with a uh, 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 more than a 200 year history, oh yes, we've got ghosts, we've got them. And uh, uh, and we're finding more all the time. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm going to wrap you up with, from my point of view, one last off the wall question. What do you think Edward Fell would say? Now Edward Fell. What would Edward Fell? Say? What would Edward Fell say today? If he walked down what he called George Street, would he recognize Fells Point? Would he not be surprised? Would he be astounded today? Hmm. Well, I don't know about George Street, but I think he'd recognize Shakespeare Street uh, if we took the street lights off. Uh, I think there would be a sufficient number of familiar silhouettes there that he would not feel like a stranger in a strange land. And I'd be baffled by the cars. Well, but, the uh, obvious technology, of course. But. And he would also be baffled by the paving. Uh, but I'm not sure. I often have said on some tours that uh, when I point out that Frederick Douglass bought his first book there on Tame Street, and I said, Tame Street, uh, the silhouette on the north side, would not alienate uh, Frederick Douglass in 1839 or thereabouts, whatever that year, 1839. Uh, he wouldn't feel at home, but he wouldn't feel totally alienated. And uh, with that in mind, 
uh, Fell being a, uh, you see, I guess they were, were uh, ex, uh, ex Quakers or anything, uh, would probably want to know what the rent was. <laughs> what are the monthly collectibles? Right. But, uh, no, I think. And maybe he's one of the ghosts that are knocking on the door all the time. I don't know. All right. I'm done. Okay. <laughs>